Atlantic City has always been a city where it can make you or break you. In old times and even now in present day. It's a city where if you're shining, the whole town will support you. A place where music was and still is loved. Boxing giants battle and beauty queens have faced off in the most kind manner. A city of rich history and unknown legends of music. Most of all, it's a city I call home. Put your makeup on, fix your hair pretty, and make me the night in Atlantic City. On our first stop, we met up with Atlantic City music legend, Joe Barrett. I was born in Atlantic City, July the 25th, 1928. I'm now 90 years old. All the old hotels, I think I, play, I, I know I played every old, old hotel in Atlantic City. Albert Blenheim and the President and the Claridge and Hatton Hall and the Shelfont, Seaside, Ambassador, all of them. And uh, then during the Second World War, Atlantic City was uh, the England General Hospital. They took over all the hotels for the GIs that were wounded coming back from Europe. And, they had about three USOs in Atlantic City, and we used to play all of them. And our band was a, an old lady playing piano who played for the silent movies before that. And uh, my, my saxophone teacher uh, was playing alto sax, and I was playing tenor sax. And the guy who owned the shoe store was playing drums. You know, there was, all the musicians were being drafted into the service. When I turned 18, I joined the Army, and, and we traveled all around Europe entertaining the troops. After that, I came home, and, uh, and then I played the 500 Club, the shows there, the Jockey Club, the shows. A regular drummer left us, and uh, we got this young kid to come over to take his place. He was about 15 years old, and it turned out he became one of the most famous drummers in the country. Harvey Mason. He was our drummer at the Jockey Club. <laughs> oh, God, I played for all the rock and rollers of Frankie Avalon and Bobby Rydell, Bobby Benton, Paul Anka, Dorothy Lamore on the show down on the Steel Pier. I was with the Ice Capades Orchestra for seven years. We had some good players in that band, too. Cat Anderson was playing trumpet in the trumpet section. I played uh, opposite the Benny Goodman sextet three different times. Harry James, Duke Ellington, Billy Holiday came over and sat with me all night long and on every intermission. She sat with me and told Clam Stewart, the bass player, Rudy Valley. This is one of the strangest ones I did a show with. And did you ever hear Popsy Randolph? He's the photographer. Well, Popsy lived in uh, Ocean City. And we became really good friends. So the night, I was playing opposite Benny Goodman. I'm, I'm backstage and Popsy walks in and he says, Joe, what are you doing here? And I said, I'm playing with the other band. I said, Popsy, would you do me a favor? When Benny Goodman comes in, would you introduce me to him? And he said, sure. So uh, it was only a few minutes later, here comes Benny Goodman through, in, in through the kitchen and he, he spots Popsy and they hug each other and, and uh, uh, Popsy said, Benny, he said, I want you to meet a friend of mine, Joe Barrett. And because Benny Goodman was my idol for years, you know. And uh, uh, to shake his hand was really a, a big thrill for me. Another place we stopped by is Patty Harris's home. A very great dancer in her time who's been on TV shows, movies, been in every nightclub in Atlantic City. Hot dog. Look at me on Life magazine. You know how it is, you're, you're a kid, and I guess you're dancing all around, knocking things over and everything, so my mother just put me in dancing school, and then uh, she spent a lot of money sending me to New York to study. And then I danced at the Club Harlem, Kentucky Avenue. That was like the street. Everybody that was anybody worked down here in Atlantic City. Any performer you can name. You know, living here in Atlantic City, my mother would take me over there to see the shows. So I just end up being in the dressing room. And before I know it, I looked up and I was in it, doing all the shows there with the biggest stars, Sammy Davis Jr. and all those people. I don't know how I did that. 
I just went over there. I must have went over there and just asked him and told him I wanted to be in it. <laughs> but uh, it was really a wonderful career, and which all you have to do with anything you do today is apply yourself. You know, get out there in the middle of it, and that's what I did. Our next trip was to visit the world-famous Atlantic City Boardwalk Hall. My name is Scott Banks. I'm the membership and events coordinator for Historic Organ Restoration Committee. We're the nonprofit tasked with rebuilding the world's largest musical instrument, the Midmerlash Pipe Organ, here in Historic Boardwalk Hall. Again, Historic Boardwalk Hall was built as the Atlantic City Convention Hall between 1927 and 1929. It was built as the world's first all purpose and convention venue. And again, some of the stage names that have crossed this space you have Luciano Pavarotti. Uh, Duke Ellington, Paul Anka, Fleetwood Mac, Bette Midler, uh, Aretha Franklin. The list could fill an entire encyclopedia with the who's who of famous performers. And that is part of the over 90 year history of what's inside this building, in addition to housing the world's largest pipe organ. Pipe organs of Historic Boardwalk Hall are actually the largest in the world. This instrument was built between August of 1929 and December of 1932 as the world's largest musical instrument. Again, we broke multiple records when this instrument was built. We have one of only two 64-foot pipes in the world, and those are triggered here as pedal stops. So those are notes played with the organist's feet. The instrument was built at the height of the Depression. It had only two months before the start of the Great Depression. It did us a lot of favors in Boardwalk Hall by giving us very cheap access to building materials, and 60 of the best and brightest minds in the organ building industry came here looking for work, and that's what allowed them to double the wind pressures that had ever been used inside a pipe organ before this and also make the world's loudest musical instrument. We have pipes in the organ that sound at over 138 decibels. Remember, a fighter jet's about 120 decibels. Again, the organ is controlled from this console, and it has seven manuals, or keyboards, which are actually geographic locations around the building, allowing the organist to take advantage of each of the individual locations of pipes as its own separate pipe organ, or combine them all together as a large ensemble. The stop tabs around the organist are how they call on their individual instruments. And because there's 1,235 of them, that's quite a lot for one person to be handling with their hands. So a memory system was developed for this and it's actually the world's first logic gate, five years before the thesis on computing was begun. So Historic Organ Restoration Committee's goal is only restoring the two pipe organs in Historic Boardwalk Hall. And again, it is a massive undertaking, over 150 tons of equipment that need to be restored, and it has a $16 million price tag. The truth of that is, though, that money is going towards materials, not the labor. And it's a long-term project, but it's bringing back Atlantic City's musical history and heritage that's so key to us here as a nonprofit. Next, we met up with Paula Jane Diamato, daughter of Skinny Diamato, owner of the 500 Club, an important businessman to the casino era of Atlantic City. My name is Paula Jane Damato. I was raised above a nightclub in Atlantic City until I was 11 years old. The 500 Club was owned by my father, and it's a place where all the celebrities of that time appeared at the club, and a lot of them honed their skills there. Um, Sammy Davis Jr. was there with his uncles, and Dean Martin and Jerry Lewis became a team at the 500 Club in 1946. So it was a very interesting way to grow up above a nightclub. My playground was the 500 Club. I would go downstairs in the morning and I'd learn to play the piano and 
the drums and then the musicians would come in at night and say, oh God, she was here again. But um, no, it, it was a lot of fun. Sammy Davis taught me how to tap dance. Um, Liberace taught me how to play the piano better than I was teaching myself. Uh, my father was very good friends with Joe DiMaggio and he used to take me across the street to the parking lot and throw baseballs at, not at me, but for yeah. me to hit. And I hit one so hard it broke a window in the hotel next door. Frank Sinatra um, was there every summer. And uh, it was, it was a, a great time. It was, you know, a calmer time in Atlantic City. But you know, you could feel, you could feel the excitement in the air. Um, I have a photograph of uh, outside of the, of the club as Frank Sinatra's car is being driven into the garage. And there are just a throng of people there just waiting to see Frank's car pull into the 500 Club. And then one time, the, there were still so many people outside that wanted to get in and see it. And this was Frank Sinatra, Dean Martin, Sammy Davis Jr., and Joey Bishop on one small stage in Atlantic City. My father went to them and said, listen, I have all these people out there, will you do another show? And that's when they started the 5 a.m. shows and they served breakfast and alcohol. My father formed the first committee for casino gaming in the 60s. And it was a group of businessmen, um, the Neustadters, Goldbergs, a lot of the hotel gentlemen. And uh, they started this plan to help Atlantic City because Atlantic City was just not going anywhere. Um, the unions came in, it was far too expensive to have uh, headliners and, and pay for the musicians because of the unions. So Atlantic City needed something and uh, they thought casino gaming could be it. The first time it was on the referendum it failed. Then they narrowed it because it was all of New Jersey, then they narrowed it down to just Atlantic City. And you know that's when the magic started in what was it, 1979? People hadn't seen that kind of entertainment in, in 10, 15 years in Atlantic City. Our next interviewee was John D'Angelo, a great piano player who has influenced many artists. My name is Johnny D'Angelo. I'm a professional entertainer, band leader, pianist, vocalist. I started playing piano in classics when I was about 9, 10 years old. I started moving into the rock and roll when I was a young kid in high school. Very popular because I played piano, so we had a lot of fun. So I formed a little band, a little trio, a little quartet. My cousin was a bartender at the Five Hundred Club in Atlantic City. And uh, he said, Skinny DeMotta was the owner there, and he said, Skinny, I want you to hear my cousin. He has a great band. So I went to Skinny's, I auditioned, and uh, Skinny loved it. About two weeks later, he comes up to me and says, you got the job. You're the steady band in the lounge. All the big acts used to come into the lounge. Sinatra, Dean Martin, when the shows were over. And Joe DiMaggio sat with me and uh, I did a song for Frank Sinatra, Learning the Blues. I was scared to death my heart was going like this, but I played it for him. One story stuck out to me, I'm working at 500 Club, and Joe DiMaggio came in with Skinny D'Amato and Dean Martin, I think, I don't know if Jeff Frank was there. And they sat in the front room and I was singing up front. Joe DiMaggio just broke up with his girlfriend, Marilyn Monroe that time. And I was singing Sinatra numbers at that time. I was doing some Sinatra because Sinatra was going to come in the back. Um, there was a song called How About You? And Joe DiMaggio was very depressed in the front. I'm young. I don't know what's going on, you know. And there's a line in that song, How About You? Is, I love Marilyn Monroe's looks. They give me a thrill. And the boys came up to me, skinny the mud, and said, what are you doing? This guy just broke up with his girlfriend. He said, are you mentioning this? I said, I'm so sorry, skinny, oh my God. I said, I'll never do it again. He said, just keep playing, don't worry about it. I covered it for you. And, uh, at that time, skinny said, you're doing a great job. We stayed there. And when the casinos came in, we had a contact, a friend of mine who was a musician. He was the band leader at the uh, uh, resorts. She said, I want you to come in with your band and open resorts up. We went in, myself, Sal Dupree, great singer, Susan Neustadter, a little girl singer, and I had a drummer and a bass player. We stayed there two years. So we did great. 
Uh, after that, uh, we left our contract there, and I had a uh, I had an offer to do a single at Caesars. Well, I had Dizzy Gillespie come up to me, one of the great jazz players, and I was letting this go. And he says, you're a very, very good son, and just remember, you'll always work. Just think of this word, simplicity. Let the people know what you're playing, and then be flashy. And after that, I listened to that, and that was a very big thing about me. So after Caesars, we went to Playboy with a band, then I went to Hilton, and I went to, uh, let's see, where else? I went, to the, I went to the Tropicano, I went to Harris. Of course, it was, uh, the Gold Nugget was the marina then. I went there. And then the casino started going down, going down, going down. And uh, I did my time, made good money. And then I did a couple of clubs, and I went to the clubs in Atlantic City. And I started working the clubs, teaching, uh, doing some things with the, uh, with a lot of students, and that's the way it ended up for me. We did a great job, and I learned a lot in the business. I worked with the best, I saw the best, and I got complimented by the best, and it was a great, it was a great spin, it was great. Now everything's changed. Everything was run by electronics and DJs, and the music business kind of started going down. And uh, live music was tough. That was a tough one. Uh, but it's coming back, there are bands, and guys like me still working, thank God, that I'm still there doing what I gotta do. I still got bands, I work concerts, do parties at the casinos, and I teach, and uh, that's the greatest thing. Next was Sal Dupree, a great singer who sung with the best in the greatest time of casinos. Well, hello everybody. I'm Sal Dupree. I'm a vocal teacher, uh, performer, uh, teach uh, theater, film, voice. Been uh, lucky enough in my lifetime. I started out in five foster homes and an orphanage for 10 years. And uh, I was blessed with a voice that when people hear me, somebody handed me a check. And I didn't have to put any tar on the roof or aluminum siding on the building. All I had to do was walk up to a mic and sing, and somehow it fed my family and kept me working. I've been teaching for a little over 40-something years now. I have students that have gone to the Miss America level, to state levels to The Voice, to American Idol. I have a million dollar winner on America's Got Talent. I have winners of Star Search and uh, many of them that are now making a lot more money than me and there's no millionaire teachers that I know of. So the rewards of watching somebody call me and say I just won my first Grammy or I just was nominated for an Oscar, that's pretty cool. Knowing that I had a little piece of it as they were growing into the game. That's her face when they announced that she won the million dollars at 11. And Tiffany Evans, this girl here, she won 200,000 on Star Search at 10 years old. I had her signed to Sony by 11. That's the original picture. I used to work with him at the Hilton in Vegas, Elvis, when I was young. This is my first record. I recorded and wrote this with my first singing group in the orphanage. When I started out with uh, Johnny D'Angelo's band, uh, I had owned four hairstyling shops at that time in Atlantic City. I was a hairdresser. Uh, I was also a, a singer, performing way before that in Wildwood and Las Vegas and so forth. To see this show at the Cow Palace in San Francisco, I used to sing there. You have Bobby Darren, Chubby Checker, Paul Anka, Buddy Holly, Chuck Berry, The Platters. And then you had a few other little guys, Alberti Brothers, Bobby Rodell, Fats Dom. It cost you, for reserved seats, $3. In 1978, the casinos opened and Johnny D'Angelo wanted to 
uh, get into the Rendezvous Lounge, which was the first lounge here in Atlantic City. And he said, Sal, I need a front man. Would you do me a favor and just come on the audition for me? And then if I get the gig, we'll say, well, you can't do it because you're busy with your shops. He said, well, no, they, they won't keep my band unless you're still there, you know, after the audition. So that was the end of me. So I would try and put a day or two and three, and then three days led to four, and four led to five. I ended up selling all my, my shops and went back into the business. And then uh, I stayed at resorts with Johnny, and then uh, Bally's called me, and I was held over in Bally for 10 years in Billy's Pub, which was the longest at that time running lounge act ever in the history of any casino on either coast, Vegas or here. And then I went to Tropicana, called me and said, would you come over here? And I stayed there for five years, worked at Taj for a year or two. And uh, and while I was teaching and while I was cutting hair, doing all three jobs, but when you're young, it's easy. When you eat too many rigatonis, it gets a little tougher. So, you know. This is uh, Tyler Perry's first movie. My student, Tiffany Evans, at one star search, played his daughter in Diary of a Mad Black Woman. Oh, by the way, when I was talking about Johnny D'Angelo, I would be singing a love ballad, and then all of a sudden uh, the waitress would walk by near the stage and he'd say, oh, could I get a pizza with pepperoni? <laughs> in the middle of me singing uh, a beautiful love song to a woman in the front row, you know, and, and he'd break up laughing, my bass player would break up laughing, and i have to try and keep a serious face and sing this romantic love ballad while he's ordering a pizza. This is Tony Angazani. She teaches now here, but she was the original Molly in the movie Annie with Carol Burnett and Bernadette Peters. I'm an old dude now. I teach it. Uh, I had my fun. I love it. Uh, I'm still doing it. Thank God I'm able to. Um, and that I'm an old man and still have an instrument that somebody's willing to pay me to sing. That is uh, a gift. Our next stop was a studio in Atlantic City owned by a great guitar player, John Mulhern. Didn't get a chance to play for Sinatra, but uh, Sarah Vaughan, Liza Minnelli, Fifth Dimension, Carrie Connick Jr., just a lot of really great entertainers. That It was the heyday of uh, entertainment in Atlantic City. <laughs> play at this, uh, at this place called All That Jazz, and it was playing with Mike Bettison. It was a jazz band, it was an after hours place, and there was a drummer, Jimmy Paxson, during the break, and I said, hey Jim, come on, I'll, I'll buy you a beer or something like that. And said, you don't want to go down there. <laughs> the quarter of the thing is, you don't want to go down there. I said, what do you mean I don't want to go down there? Because you know who that guy is? And I said, no. He says, uh, that's Nicky Scarfo. You don't want to go down there. <laughs> so that was one of those things where I didn't know anything. I was just in town. I didn't know. It was just it was a rude awakening for a young uh, kid. Next, we caught up with 50s guitar legend Charlie Gracie, whose guitar solos and music influenced the Beatles and so on. Well, my name is Charlie Gracie. Since the day I was born till today, I never changed my name. Now, I've been in show business all my life. This is my 66th year in the business. Started out when I was a kid. I was 10 years old when I started playing the guitar. I was one of the, guy, one of the few early kids to make rock and roll records. I made my first record in 1950, late 51, 52, just about ready to go into high school. Teenagers in recording those days. I was one of the few, maybe not the first, but and then we, and everybody made fun of us. Rock and roll never lasts. It's goofy music. It's sinful music. Come on, it was dance music. We were the dance generation. I finally got lucky with a hit record in 1957, number one hit. Did the Ed Sullivan show? I thought I died and went to heaven. I mean, it was great. We were kids. I, I, my God, when I had my hit, I was 20 years old. I was a baby. Then uh, after working all the theater and re restaurants and nightclubs in the in America. I finally got booked in Europe, in Great Britain. I was only the second American to bring rock and roll to that continent. In my audience at the time, I didn't know, 
I'm from South Philly, what do I know about England, you know what I mean? There was the Rolling Stones, the Beatles, Van Morrison, Joe Cocker, Graham Nat, all of them all came to see me. I was four or five years old, they were kids. And when they saw me, I was a guy that really played the guitar. Most guys didn't play the guitar, he just strummed it. You know, like Elvis, he just strummed it. And I was a guitar player. And it must have impressed them. I didn't know that at the time. As years went on, I got to meet them all. And said, Charlie, you're one of the reasons why we're at, you know, I just, I couldn't believe it. You know, they used to put the names in the cement like mm -hmm. they do the Chinese, Chinese theater in Hollywood. Yeah. Well, I had my name put in the cement and I have a picture taken on Cashbox magazine. It was Skinny D'Amato, my father, Bernie Rothbard, one of my agents, or my agent, I should say, and it was uh, uh, Bernie Lowe, the owner of Cameo Records. We hit the jackpot, we had number one at that time, right? So years later, you know what they did? They broke my cement up, they put Sammy Davis in my place. <laughs> <laughs> I've only got had to take mine out. Oh, but anyway, I was happy to have it there for a while. It was a, what, a, what an honor, you know. Yeah. And uh, of course, I worked Atlantic City a lot when I was a kid. We all did the Steel Pier. Mm -hmm. It was a very famous place. They played the Hialeah. I played some of the great hotels there, the uh, Ambassador, the President. Mm -hmm. that was a, Atlantic City was a show place. You know, it's not, once they put the casinos in, all they booked was superstars. Yeah. But all us little guys all worked. We made a living playing the lounges, you know what I mean? That's how we made a living. It, 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 night, I'm a nightclub performer. Yeah. That's how I was in that category. And what happened was the nightclub circuit with the TV and the thing, it just faded out. It's a shame. There's no nightclubs left in America, but it was a nice night out. You take your wife or your girlfriend, you see maybe an opening show, like a, a girl dancer, a dance team. Then you have the comic come on, right? Yeah. And then the main uh, artist, with it, musician, singer, and they have four or five piece band. It was a great night out. You spend maybe 20 bucks, big deal, you know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. For 20 bucks, you just about get two <laughs> drinks now. <laughs> it was, they were great days, but you know, they're gone and they'll never come back, but we lived them. And we could look back with some wonderful memories, you know. Yeah, I, you know, I never thought, I'm a kid from South Philly, you know, we just about had bread on the table. That's I was born in 1936, mm -hmm. right in the middle of the Depression. I've had some good fortune. I've worked hard all my life as a musician. I still love what I do all these many years. Is that right? <laughs> is filled with stories from this city. It's amazing to find out how much I didn't know about Atlantic City. I am happy to share this knowledge in each individual story so that they are never forgotten. Winners and losers and don't get caught on the wrong side of that line. Well, if you're tired of coming out on this losing end. So honey, last night I met this guy and I'm gonna do a little favor for him. Well, I guess everything dies, baby.